Kate, welcome along to Music Box. And many congratulations on the success of the album, Hounds of Love, and of course the singles, which has also been very successful. How are you coping with the success this time round? Are you finding it a lot easier than Wuthering Heights days? Yes and no. I mean, it's easier because it's something I've experienced before. So I don't have the trauma of going into things that are totally unknown. But on the other hand, I think it's just as hard coming out of such an intense working period, which is very private now, i.e. working in the studio on an album, where mm. maybe we're uh, in the studio constantly for a year, say, and then I come out into the whole world of promotion. And it can be um, just a bit scary, I guess, a bit daunting, coming from such a private existence to such a public one. Yes, how do you cope with the press? Because I, I know you, you've talked about them in the past and haven't been too uh, happy with the whole situation of, of promotion. I don't... Um, I don't really enjoy promoting. It's something that I do for my work. I feel that, obviously, when you spend a lot of time working on something, it's only right that you come out and let people know that the album's there. I don't feel that ever, hopefully, I'm, I'm not promoting myself, but the work. I'm being the saleswoman mm. for the record or the video or whatever it is at the time. Because the press find it very difficult, don't they, to dig up juicy news items on you, and they're trying hard all the time. I mean, there was a rumour one of the reasons why you've been away from the scene for quite a long time is you'd risen to 18 stone. Yes. It's ridiculous, isn't it? How do they come up with these things? I think when you don't um, give people anything, they make things up. Uh, I think it's very flattering on this, lots of levels, the fact that people are still concerned about writing about me, the fact that they still remember me and are hanging on to me. It's very flattering. Yeah, has it surprised you that uh, you've had this instant success once again? I mean, were you at all worried that people may have forgotten all about Kate Bush? I think what you worry about is that people don't like what you've worked on hard. I mean, again, I don't feel it's me that people are responding to um, directly. It's myself through the expression of the music and the work. And it's, I can't tell you how rewarding it is for people to have received this so warmly. It's been a big success and a great album too. We'll talk about that a bit later on. We'll right back to your school days. Now, you came away from school with 10 O-levels. So does that mean you were a very attentive pupil? Um, I think I've just found the whole system of school something that didn't really appeal to me. I couldn't really express myself in that whole system. So presumably your, your favourite lesson was music? Um, I did enjoy music and English, but I just, um, I just didn't really enjoy school as I got older. Why was that? It's very hard to say. Um, I just... Uh, it was very restrictive, was it? Yes, I think mm. I did find it restrictive. Right, so you couldn't get away quick enough? No, at that point in my life, that's, I really did want to leave school. Dave Gilmore of Pink Floyd fame gave you your big break. How did that come about? Well, I'd been writing, I suppose, since I was about 13, seriously. And um, it was my family and my brother, John, who felt that it would be a good idea to see if we could get some of my songs published. And through a friend of the family, we made a contact with Dave Gilmore, who at that time was... Uh, scouting for talent to perhaps produce or uh, encourage. And um, he came down and heard some songs and I think was impressed and basically eventually put up the money for me to go into the studio and make three tracks properly produced. And through those tracks, I got the recording contract. Right. Now, you mentioned your family. Did you, have you always had a lot of support from them from a very early age? Yes. They've always encouraged the music. Yes, I think so. Because your dad taught you piano, didn't he? He didn't teach me piano, but he was definitely the encouraging force when I, I was writing at that time. Um, whenever I'd written a song, I'd always go and ask him to come and listen to it. And uh, he was brilliant, totally encouraging, and in the right way in that he wasn't pushing me into it, um, which I think, especially for children, is the wrong thing to do because they rebel against that automatically. Something which you did at school at times. I don't know if I was rebellious, but there were certainly things I didn't enjoy being taught. What's the Katie Bush band? It was a three-piece that consisted of Del Palmer on bass, Brian yeah. Bath on guitar, and uh, Vic Smith, who was the drummer. And where did you tour? Around London? Yes, we did uh, clubs and pubs in the London area, but this only was three months, no longer than that. So how did you feel about doing that at the time? Because obviously it was the first time you'd actually played an audience. I really enjoyed it, and um, it was just the experience I wanted at that point. I was looking for things that would 
take me further into where I wanted to go, which was the music business. And I'd been training as a dancer. And this felt like the perfect stage, really, to um, go into a live situation. Looking back on your debut album, The Kick Inside, how do you listen? Do you, do you often listen to it now? Do you still put it on the turntable at home? No, I haven't heard it for years. Why is that? Um, it's old. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you look upon that album now? Is, is it sort of ex very experimental? I think um, it was probably the least experimental of all the albums. I'd written, say, 200 songs, from which we choose, chose the 13 songs that went on that. And um, it was recorded very quickly. There was very little experimentation. It was something that had a lot of uh, forethought gone into it. And of course, you had the big number one single, Wuthering Heights. To people who aren't devout fans of Kate Bush, you mention your name and they immediately say, oh, Wuthering Heights. Even nowadays, does that bother you at all? No, I don't think it would be right of me to be rude to a song that has done so much for me. How, how did you feel, though, when it went straight to number one? You must have been very taken aback. Yes, very surprised. And it was sort of onwards from there, I suppose. I mean, it must have encouraged you, to, obviously, to do a lot more and... Uh, did you immediately set to work on the next album? It was very difficult, that whole stage, because being so new to the whole business and straight in with such a successful song, it meant really the next year of my life was nothing but promotion. And I think it was quite early on during that time that I decided that promotion was something that had to come secondary to the music or I was going to spend my whole life promoting and never ever making another album. So um, it was a very busy period for me then. What are your main songwriting influences? Obviously quite a difficult one because you must have many. Mm, yes, I mean that is a very difficult question. Subject matter is, uh, it stems from people, either through their expressions in films, books, things that people tell you about, things you witness. Musically I think that's a much more obscure area and in a way it's the music that often will suggests the subject matter, so the music is quite often the thing that sparks it all off. And that comes from the air, really. <laughs> Do you ever feel that you may have missed out on other aspects of life that other teenagers may have enjoyed because of your rather isolated life? You spent a lot of time in the recording studio promoting the next album. Did you miss out on a varied social life, for instance? No, I think in many ways it... It made me meet more people in the way I wanted to, more than would ever have been possible if I hadn't gone into the business. I mean, it's isolated in that you meet certain types of people all the time, but it's continually challenging. And uh, I think probably I have met more people and had much more experience through what I'm doing now than if I hadn't. Um, there are no regrets. <laughs> and you've never felt you were pushed into adult life too quickly? No, I think um, that's something that happens to kids now uh, much sooner than it did for me. And I think it's something that is generally happening sooner all the time. Kids just grow up quicker now. Because you never had any worries about getting a job, did you? Um, yes, I did. I think when you leave school and you don't know what you're going to do, um, I was very much throwing myself to fate. Um, if it hadn't have worked, I would have been in a very difficult situation. Um, I just worked very hard and hoped that I'd be able to make something of it. And I was very lucky. Did you ever consider an alternative career? I considered it, but it was never anything serious. Um, and that's why I felt I had to leave school and just go for it, because if I didn't make an attempt to throw myself into that lifestyle, I didn't feel it was something that was going to come to me. It was something you had to go out and get. Was that partly influenced by your upbringing from your parents? I don't know what it was influenced by. I think it was... the very strong desire in me that had started when I first started working at the piano, um, that this was what I wanted to do. I didn't want to go to university. I didn't want to be in a job where I couldn't be creative. But how did other people react to that? They must have been a bit taken aback. You mean my family? Yeah, your family in particular. Yes, I think obviously my parents were very concerned. Um, I was leaving school, going into something that was completely insecure. and. Uh, I think really they, they had a tremendous amount of faith in me, in that they wanted me to be happy. And they understood that I wasn't just um, spending my time doing nothing. I was very seriously working on a career that could be insecure, but they had a great deal of faith in me. Do you have a, a favourite album? 
I think um, the last album you do is quite often your favourite one because uh, that's the one you put the most energy into recently. But um, I think the fourth album held some very precious moments for me, so I'd say that one for now. <laughs> the Dreaming? Yes. A lot of people would have said that album was rather abstract and, and possibly a bit obscure, and it didn't sell in the quantities that the others had done. Did that influence you on your new album? Very difficult to say. I, I don't know what influences you between one and the other except your life, really. You, you change with the environment, and my environment did change between the last album and this one. I moved out of the city and into the country, and I think those two energies are very apparent on both albums. The fourth album is very much an oppressed city atmosphere album, and this one that's just released is very much a freer elemental album. Did you feel a real need to get out into the country then? I was getting fed up with being in London, yeah. I don't know about a real need, but um, I think it's a very good thing for me. I'm glad I did. It certainly helped me relax as a person. And did it drain your creative energies then, being in the town? No, I don't think you could say it drains your creative energies, because if anything, um, and I'm sure a lot of people would agree with me, the sense of oppression and energy that you can get from cities can be very, very productive to writing songs. But um, I found I was getting too many distractions that were stopping me having the time to concentrate on my writing. So rather than it being productive, it was getting in the way. Do you now commune with nature? <laughs> I don't know about commune with nature, but uh, certainly when I look out my window and there's trees and fields, I feel a lot happier than uh, concrete blocks out there. When you see the trees and the fields, do you see a song as well? Um, no, no, I think um, it's, not, it's not quite as basic as that. But there's no doubt that when you're writing and you look out the window and there is that force out there, that it does affect you very differently from if it, if it was a city or, or by the sea. It, definitely your environments do affect you much more than we think. And of course your working environments too. You've just uh, designed and built your own studio. How are you finding that, working in your own studio? It's superb. There really couldn't have been better decisions made in this time between the last album and this, where I've moved and we've moved the studio to where we are. Um, there are so many areas where it's helped. Again, I feel much more relaxed. I'm much freer to work in an uninhibited way. Um, I do get quite nervous if you've got people you don't know coming in, listening. Uh, in the London studio, people are always coming in, borrowing pieces of equipment. The phone's always ringing, and it's costing you a phenomenal amount of money every hour. So you do feel guilty if you experiment, because you feel you're just throwing the money away. At home, um, obviously, there aren't those pressures at all. Because you've got quite a reputation as a slow worker. Yes. Why, why do you feel that need to, to take everything so slowly? I don't think I feel the need to take things slowly at all. In fact, it's very, very frustrating for me that things take as long as they do. It's never planned. Um, it's just something that takes over once you get into the studio and the songs are there. They really do create their own life force and they take over you and they just drag me behind them until they're finished. And it's, it's strange because quite often, you know, I wouldn't really want to go in and work on the album. I was tired. but. Um, you just sort of go in there, it drags you behind it. Have you ever had pressure from the record company to get on with it? Um, I don't have that relationship with the record company. I, I make an album and I present it to them. Um, and I think if they're happy with the album, then our relationship is successful. You, of course, had the big hit single, Running Up That Hill, taken from the Hounds of Love album. What inspired that song? That was the first song I wrote when we moved to the country. Um, I think it was perhaps an expression of freedom from the things that I'd, I'd felt before. But it's very much about love and the power of love and the frustration of misunderstanding with, within relationships. And that if a man could become a woman and a woman a man within their relationship, that perhaps they'd understand a bit more about each other. And that's the deal with God? Yes. <laughs> There's some very complicated dance routines in the video. It must have taken you a long time to work those out. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I was working there with uh, Diane Gray, choreographer, who I met a couple of years ago. It, it's very exciting working with other people. Um, 
I think especially so when you spend such a lot of time, say, in the studio where you're only working with a set group, say, two other people. And it was very inspiring working with uh, a choreographer who's also such a good dancer. And um, we got on well together. We had lots of fun. Two of the Hounds of Love album is a concept piece called The Ninth Wave. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's about someone who is in the water for the night, uh, alone in the water. And it's really about their past, present and future coming to keep them awake, to stop them drowning, to stop them going to sleep until the morning comes. It isn't immediately obvious, is it, if you listen to the album? No, I don't think so. I don't know if that's uh, relevant or important, though. I think the most important thing is that people that listen to it get something out of it that they enjoy. Right. Now, you seem to have a fascination with water. I noticed that a couple of your favourite movies, Don't Look Now and Cruel Sea, which are very much on a watery theme. So have you a fascination for water? Yes, yes I do. I think everyone does, really. I think The Cruel Sea was one film that I particularly mentioned, though, as being a very influential force for this side. Um, so it would have to do something with water. And also there's the uh, Tennyson poem, isn't there, The Coming of Arthur? Yes, I think um, a lot of people tend to presume that the whole side was written from that quote. And in fact, it was completely the other way around, where I just needed a title for the whole piece and there was nothing within it, any of the songs or any of the titles that were right for it. So I just started looking through some books to try and find a title and found that quote that seemed to be um, saying more or less what I wanted to say. So it was used uh, to express the title. And you want to turn the piece into a video? Yes, it's just an idea. I, I would very much like to turn it into film. I mean, for me now, film and video are two very separate visual things. Mm. But... Um, for cinema release? Yes, ideally. But it, it's just something you can talk about at this point. I mean, really, until early next year, I wouldn't have time to start checking out the feasibility. But it is something I would like to do, but whether it will happen or not. We'll see. Right, we mentioned drowning. Have you a, a phobia of drowning and death? I mean, does it worry you in particular, or is it something you just take in your stride? I don't think I have a phobia of water at all. Um, I think it is something that we should all be certainly scared of. We should be respectful of it. But I don't think I have a phobia of water. And death, I think, is something that um, anyone who writes would certainly deal with death at some point. Um, I rather like Woody Allen's quote about how uh, he doesn't mind dying, but he just doesn't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Have you any religious beliefs? No, not, not, um, not ones that I could name. I mean, I do believe in certain... I suppose cause and effect is something that I would believe in a bit, but whether they're religious beliefs, I, I don't know. Cause and effect, explain that. Well, I think if you behave in a certain way, then that energy will come back to you. Um, uh, the boomerang syndrome. <laughs> so the more positive one is in their thoughts and actions, uh, the more positive life they'll lead, and vice versa. Uh, yes, I, but I think there is a lot in that. But I think there's also a lot in that if you are positive and can be, even if things around you aren't necessarily coming back, at least you cope with them better. So you think there's a sort of powerful force behind it all? Yes, I think it's actually a survival technique, a self-preservation where if you can always keep coming back, keep coming up again, not staying down there, then um, you're going to get a lot more down, you're going to be a lot more in control of what's happening than if you're depressed, unhappy. We mentioned earlier that one of your favourite movies was Don't Look Now, which stars Donald Sutherland. Is that the reason you picked him for your new video? I don't know if it's the reason. Um, I mean, Don't Look Now is a totally brilliant film and everyone in it, it was wonderful. But this was a very different piece and it was um, quite coincidental I suppose that we thought of Donald. I don't think at that time there were any references to Don't Look Now but there couldn't have been anyone better and we were so lucky because um, he was our first choice and through a friend we managed to find a way of contacting him and um, it was quite incredible really to think that, uh, that he did it. I still find it hard to He's believe. He's been quite a fan of yours for years hasn't he? Um, well, if he was, I certainly didn't know that. I don't, I don't think so. Right, what are those press reports again? Tell us a bit about the song then, Cloud Busting. Very much inspired by a book which I found 
must be nine years ago now, on a bookshelf. I just picked it off the shelf and read it, and it's quite an extraordinary book. It's very sad and moving, and it's written by a, the man, his name's Peter Reich, about when he was a child. It was the relationship between himself as a child and his father, and it's written very much through the eyes of a child, so it has an incredible sense of innocence and intimacy between him and this great big man who was his father and meant everything to him. And uh, Peter Reich's father was a very respected psychoanalyst who did a lot of work. And uh, one thing that's mentioned in the book that's quite aside from his uh, theoretical work was that he had a machine that could make it rain. And the two of them would go out together and make it rain. And um, this was really where the video came in to explain all this. But uh, it really is an extraordinary book, and everyone that I gave it to to read said it was the saddest book they'd ever read. There are many people credited on the latest album, Hounds of Love, and the credits include Terry Gilliam of uh, Monty Python fame. Why did you give him a mention? Terry's been a great help in um, pointing me towards people I could use for the videos. Uh, I'm a great fan of Terry, I think. He's a brilliant director. I love his films. I think he's more talented than people have appreciated yet. He's a really great filmmaker, and I think a serious one, too. And um, I just managed to be lucky enough to make contact with him, and um, he's helped me find people uh, that I could uh, work with on these last two videos. So you're quite a fan of slapstick and that type of thing? No, I'm not a fan of flats slapstick, blah, 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 blah. but I am a fan of... Um, of doing things unusually and brilliantly. I mean, I think his sense of composition, his sense of photographing things is superb. It's brilliant. Enjoy Faulty Towers? Wonderful. I don't think there's anyone that doesn't, really. Is there? No, Have you met absolutely. anyone that doesn't like no, it? I love it, personally. Now, you've had a great deal of success in a relatively short time, really. So where do you go from here? It must be difficult to know what to do next. Not at all. I think the trouble is it takes me so long to do things that I... I sort of build up a backlog of, of not being able to do all the things I want. So um, it's, it's enjoyable for me to get the album finished, and when this promotional work is finished, that means I can launch into a, a next project. I think I'd always like to be able to make albums. That's something that is very important to me, making music. And apart from that, uh, I think it's experimentation from now on, really. Do you ever see a day when you might retire? No, not yet. <laughs> a few years, eh? Well, I hope so. Don't write me off yet. Do you I'm see yourself there. a little cottage in the countryside eventually? Yes, I'd like to be in a little cottage in the countryside now, I think. I don't think you have to retire to do that. It just makes um, travelling into London a bit longer. Ever any plans of a family? No, again, not yet. My work um, takes up all my time. Is that a, an altogether healthy thing, do you think? I don't know if it's healthy, but um, it's certainly very enjoyable. And um, I get a tremendous amount of satisfaction out of actually feeling I've achieved something, like finishing an album or finishing a video. Because it's always so hard when you're stuck in the middle of the project, and sometimes you're never sure if you're going to be able to finish it. So to actually reach that point, that relief when the thing is over, it's uh, incredibly rewarding. Particularly when it's such a big success. Yes, particularly. Thanks, Kate.